Welcome to part 25 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. The other Lackawanna Cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And we're here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in the midst of lots of activity, which may be competing with us as we go along here. What we're going to do today is do a trek between here, Scranton, and Binghamton, New York. Now in between is the, what I'll call the Pennsylvania cutoff, the Clark Summit Halstead cutoff. Well, nothing like a train or, in this case, a, a bunch of locomotives to steal the show. But what we're going to be doing today is go from Scranton to Binghamton, New York. In between, between Clark Summit, which if you were to look up through the hills here, is up in that notch over there. And the railroad goes from here to there, 1.4%. Uh, grade going up the hill to Clark Summit. At the top of the grade is the beginning of the new line. We're actually going to get, get to see the old line as well. There were two lines. There were two lines. Uh, an old line, which ran between Clark Summit and Halstead, and the new line, which ran or does run because it's a currently active Norfolk Southern Railroad between Clark Summit and Halstead. Now why are we going all the way to Binghamton? Well we'll explain as we go along but Scranton and Binghamton are really the two major cities in this area and I don't want to say there's nothing in between but many trains, I'll use it as an example, the Phoebe Snow would go from here at Scranton, just up the ways here, go through here past Bridge 60. I'm going to move over to Bridge 60 here. Bridge, Bridge 60 is over here, 60 Tower, and would go up and head on off and, and would not stop until it reached Binghamton. As we go through our episode today, uh, we're going to talk about the other cutoff. And to help us do that, we've asked, and he's agreed, agreed a year ago, as a matter of fact, Josh Stull, a historian who grew up in Nicholson, Pennsylvania. Uh, Josh will be helping us out. He'll be joining us. He'll be joining us at Nicholson, appropriately. But what we're going to do is to go up next to Clark Summit. We'll talk about the, the cutoff. We'll show you where that cutoff began. And then we're going to take a ride along the old line, or the old road in Pennsylvania, uh, which is now a, a highway, has been a highway for a long time. We'll explain why that is the case. And, and then we'll meet Josh and we'll go from there. So here we go. Here we are in Chinchilla, Pennsylvania, the village of Chinchilla. The rail line is behind us here. We are in Liggett's Gap, which in the grand scheme of things played a crucial role in the building of the Lackawanna Railroad west of Scranton. Scranton is in that direction. Clark Summit, which is our next stop, is in that direction. 
Chinchilla itself was not very important, but the location of the rail line, as I said, was crucial because if, it, if this gap created by Lickett's Creek did not exist, it's not clear how they would actually build a railroad from here and then all the way to Clark Summit and beyond. Now, I don't know exactly where the station was in Chinchilla. There was a station. It was discontinued in 1902. So the railroad didn't think very much of the station, but once again, the actual rail line location was extremely important to the, uh, the building of the rail line from Scranton and to the west. Uh, oh, you're probably wondering how, did, how the heck did it get the name Chinchilla? Apparently the postmaster, who I, it seems as if was a female, had a coat made of Chinchilla and somehow that name stuck and that's how the village of Chinchilla got its name. So, our next stop is Clark Summit, and we're working our way to the beginning of the Pennsylvania Cutoff. Here we are at the station in Clark Summit, about two miles west of where we were just before Chinchilla. Chinchilla is in the, in the midst of the Lickens Gap. We're now at the top of the hill and the beginning of the cutoff is eh, maybe about a quarter mile or so down this way. The tracks are in this direction. We'll walk over there in just a second. When we get over yonder, which is our, our next stop, we'll talk about the similarities and, and differences between the Pennsylvania cutoff and the New Jersey cutoff. One difference is that the Pennsylvania cutoff didn't have the same degree of, shall we say, finality at the, the ends of each uh, of, the, of the cutoff itself. In other words, in New Jersey, you have on the east end, Port Morris Junction, west end, Slateford Junction. Here you don't quite have that. Um, when I was here back in the 80s, there were still tracks here in front of the station. I don't, I don't recall, it's now 30 some odd years ago. I don't think they went very much further. And I don't even remember if there was any kind of uh, active customers here, but the, I remember the tracks being here. So. There was a junction per se, but it was really just a spur for when the, the cutoff was put in and uh, opened in 1915. Um, they left one track in, in here, and, uh, but basically everything west of here with a couple of exceptions, which we'll get into, uh, was basically abandoned and the tracks were removed. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the station, this setup is somewhat similar to the Lake of Pakong station. This station, this building here opened in 1913, so it's actually a couple years before the, the cutoff opened. They put it up here on the hill. Now that the old line was still here at that point, but when you go over here, you, if, if someone, let's say, was brought their baggage into the station, got the ticket and gonna wait for the train, they'd have to go down to, to meet the train quite a ways down. It's about, uh, I'm gonna guess 30 feet or so to go down. But there were stairs to go down. Uh, that I'm trying to remember if there was a ramp or somehow where the, the baggage could be hauled down because um, going down a number of steps would have been inconvenient to say the least. But, uh, and there was a shelter down here so in, in bad weather, they, a person would have been able to go down here and be ready for the train to arrive 
down down below. But when they built the cutoff, they excavated out. So this is a deep cut here to lessen the grade to, to the extent that they could from the start of the cutoff, which is once again down, you know, I'm saying a quarter mile, maybe just a little bit more, but that's about it. So this is the station at Clark Summit. Our next stop, we're just going to basically drive around and end up just on the other side here of the right of way at what is called Lackawanna, old Lackawanna uh, Drive, which is basically the continuation of the old line, uh, the right of way of the old line. Now, of course, the tracks are long gone, but the right of way of the old line, which will follow all the way to Nicholson. Okay, so straight ahead you can see the continuation of the right of way. It's going west from the station here at Clark Summit. Uh, we can't go that way, so we're going to have to just take a real quick jog over onto this street here. past the fire station in Clark Summit. Looks like a building that lasted from the railroad era. That's your old Lackawanna Trail. Here we are in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. We're at the top of the grade. And what we're looking at now, and we'll show you a similar shot from 1915, 1916 of this. But basically, where you see that overhead bridge in the distance, just beyond that would be the beginning of the new line, the Pennsylvania cutoff, the Clark Summit Holstead cutoff. Beyond there is the, the grade down to, to Scranton where we just came from. To our right and where we're going to walk over to is the grade of the old line here in Pennsylvania that the cutoff here replaced. They're literally side by side. So let's walk over. And you can see up on the sign there, didn't have enough room. It's old Lacka Trail, but it's old Lackawanna Trail. And the reason why it's the old Lackawanna Trail is that this is the right of way of the old line. Uh, it would go down basically where you, where we showed you just a few seconds ago and then continues on and we're, we're going to take you on a ride but just to show you now continues on so clark summit the the beginning of the i'll call it the pennsylvania cutoff uh, there are different names that are sometimes used the nicholson cutoff 
Summit Cutoff, the Clark Summit Halstead Cutoff, the Pennsylvania Cutoff, you know, and so forth. So when I'm referring to the cutoff this time, unless I specifically say the New Jersey cutoff, I'm really referring to that line, which is right over there, and the old line, which is what I'm physically standing on. Now, there, in, in terms of comparing the New Jersey cutoff with the Pennsylvania cutoff, there are similarities and there are differences. talking about similarities, well, they're both cutoffs, <laughs> obviously. They, but they were built for different reasons. The New Jersey cutoff, they certainly wanted to be more efficient, but they also wanted to save mileage, and they saved 11 miles for the New Jersey cutoff when that was built. This cutoff, however, only it saved about three and a half miles, roughly wasn't really the major reason for building it. It was really to lessen the grades and to uh, decrease the number of curves. The, this line here, and this continues on, uh, was almost 50% curvature. In other words, 50% of the line, the mileage, was curves, which uh, was detrimental to running an efficient operation, particularly when you think about that when the, the cutoff here was built, which was built between May 1st of 1912 and opened on November 6th, 1915, in those days the, the big commodity that the Lackawanna Railroad was carrying was coal coming out of the Scranton Valley up the, the grade, but it wasn't, the, the grade is still there, that'll always be there. there, there's really nothing you can do about it from a geographical perspective. But what they could do was to make the line and the operation more efficient up here, uh, because this particular old line was more or less a roller coaster ride with curves and all that kind of stuff. So what they did was when they built the line, it was that with that intent, rather than so much in, in saving distance. But that presented its own issues. Whereas with the New Jersey cutoff, the old road in New Jersey was retained. Yes, it was downgraded, but it wasn't, as would happen with this, abandoned. It stayed in operation until about 1970, although it, it petered out as time went on, but it was never really abandoned, to, at least certainly not as, as quickly as this was. This, this line is, once the Pennsylvania cutoff is, is opened, this line is quickly downgraded and, and for the most part, abandoned. Uh, much of it for tax reasons, and it, actually it, much of the, the, the line becomes basically a road, a, a, a highway. And that was primarily for tax purposes. Of course, that would come back to haunt because then what that basically did was to create a, a parallel highway to the railroad, which did not previously exist. But getting back to the New Jersey cut off the old road in New, uh, in New Jersey, that was geographically, the old road was geographically removed from the cutoff, whereas these are literally going to be side by side for much of the distance between here and, and Halstead. In some cases, they actually will cross each other, and as we get towards Halstead, there'll be, a, there'll be sections where they literally are the, the same. But once again, the, the overarching goal was not necessarily to save mileage, but to create a more efficient operation, which they did. Now, one of the downsides to having these side-by-side -side lines, in other words, if, if the, the cutoff, this cutoff, would primarily go 
up into the hills and, and literally in some cases go off into this, be bored into the side of a mountain, whereas the, this line here was down here. So there's usually this kind of thing that was happening um, for much of the, the route. The difference, the only difference being is when we're here, between here and Nicholson, the lines diverge. But once you get past Nicholson, the lines really are almost like this much of the time. And now the problem that created was that you had customers on this line who could not necessarily use this line. And if you look at the old correspondence from 1916 and such, where they're trying to tear out this, this line here to save taxes and, 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 and basically recoup uh, salvage costs that would be good towards the bottom line, they're also having to deal with customers on this line that are, they don't want to be abandoned, so to speak. And actually there is a, one concession was that there was a line, a, sort of a temporary line uh, that was built between Nicholson and Foster. Um, and, but for the most part, this line would get basically abandoned as, as time goes on. So that means that these customers here either have to go to here somehow, or just basically stop using the railroad entirely. That issue did not emerge on the New Jersey cutoff because New Jersey cutoff and the old road in New Jersey were miles apart and they were treated almost as separate railroads. Um, but with an operation that the, the old road in New Jersey supported the cutoff in many ways. That was not the case here. This is the, totally different in that respect. Uh, other similarities, well, um, you, it, the building of this particular cutoff was divided into 10 sections. There's an 11th section that's west of New Milford, which is kind of interesting, uh, but essentially 10 sections, whereas the New Jersey cutoff was divided into seven sections, not of necessarily of equal length. They tried to balance the amount of work. Eh, it didn't exactly work. Um, for various reasons, which we've gone over in previous episodes. But here they divided into 10, well, 11 sections for all intents and purposes. Some of the same folks that names you would be familiar with has been mentioned in, for example, our episode on the construction of cutoff, appear again. Uh, David W. Flickweir uh, did work both on the New Jersey cutoff and the Pennsylvania cutoff. Uh, Lincoln Bush, he actually joins Flickweir, Flickweir and Bush, involved with the Tunkhannock Viaduct. I'm sure Josh will t tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, Walter Gahagan, and so forth. Uh, not all the same people, but um, there were a few that, were, uh, that managed to get themselves into doing both cutoffs. Uh, they had to build new stations. Not all the stations on this cutoff were built of reinforced concrete as they were on the New Jersey cutoff. Uh, we'll see, um, well, there were brick stations, so it was not an exclusive edict that somehow they'd have to use reinforced concrete. However, the two viaducts, and there are two viaducts, two big viaducts on this line, the, both of which are bigger than Haynesburg, which is the bigger of the two uh, viaducts on the New Jersey cutoff. But you'll notice a very strong similarity in terms of their style, shall we say, the Beaux-Arts type of style that was used. And so forth. I mean, there, there are a number of ways to compare the two cutoffs, but really they're quite a bit different in some ways. Uh, this one being in Pennsylvania, of course, but you have really two large cities on outer reaches, not 
part of the cutoff, but where the cutoff is between, certainly it's not quite the same with the New Jersey cutoff because you have the Delaware Water Gap and you have Port Morris or the basically Lake of Patcon, so it's really quite a bit different in that respect. In terms of passenger service, there, the differences here is that, for example, with the New Jersey cutoff, Blairstown remained as a stop all the way to the end of passenger service in the beginning of 1970. Uh, by the 1950s, there's very little in the way of passenger service on, on this cutoff. Freight service, yes, of course. I mean, it's still the main line, but um, passenger service where the trains would be stopping, the, you know, trains like the Phoebe Snow still ran, but they didn't stop in between. In other words, like in places like Nicholson or Foster or New Milford, maybe New Milford. New Milford was probably the closest. In terms of a, a, a station that actually did see some passenger service into the 1950s. But otherwise, the other stations have been long downgraded and uh, for them not being used. So anyway, that's a, an overview of the, the cutoff here. So what we're going to do is we're going to drive along the old line, which is the old Lackawanna Trail, and give you an idea of what that's like. And our next stop is the big ticket item, I guess you would have to say, on, on, on this particular video. Although, you know, stick with us for the rest of it. But the, obviously the, the big crowd pleaser is the Tonkinic Viaduct. And that is our next stop. Okay, we're on the old Lackawanna Trail, which is the old line in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania cutoff is to our right. Double track railroad for the most part. The, the, the lack one, if you look at their correspondence, they seemed like they desperately wanted to sell off the, the right-of-way, this old right-of-way which was um, being abandoned. And as a result, they wanted to probably find the, the quickest way to do that. And the quickest way to do that was to essentially donate it to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and uh, that took care of the tax problem. Uh, but ultimately, it to some extent would have created another problem, which I mentioned previously, which was that this is now a parallel line to compete with your, your railroad, at least in terms of passenger, and then later years, certainly in terms of uh, freight as well. Um, the, in this section, 
we we diverge from the the new line. The new line will be to our west, and we will be for the most part, well, for the whole time before Nicholson to the east of the of the new line. Now, the the Lackawanna ran from Hoboken to Buffalo, so. If you were going from Hoboken to Buffalo, that was considered westbound. The section we are covering now, the direction we're going is westbound. Although, if you were to look at a, a compass, for the most part, we're going to be going north. So it's a little bit deceiving. So when I say east and west, you know, if you're going north, well, to your left would be east, to your right would be west. But it's um, it, it's only because we're going to Binghamton, and once once, well, and we're not going to go beyond Binghamton. But once you get to Binghamton, the, the railroad goes almost due west for a while, to Elmira and, and so forth. But along the southern tier. But so, what I refer to westbound, it's really t what they call timetable west. Now the first station, and here we see Dalton, the first station on this line west of Clark Summit was Dalton. And there, the station was here, but they, when they expanded this road, it was torn down, so it no longer exists. It's difficult to tell when driving along whether this was really a railroad or not at one time. There may be vestiges of, of old businesses and, and things that might suggest that if you knew enough about the area that, well, okay, this, this must have been a railroad at one time. But don't forget that this, this line, where we are right now, hasn't operated as a railroad in 114 years, basically. No, 100, 104 years, sorry, I'm, I, my own calculation is wrong. But over, over a century, it, it's been. So, essentially, it, it wouldn't be surprising that there's not going to be a lot that we're going to see that's going to strike us as being um, now this is a railroad. Now you can tell oh, there, there are curves. Now, now the original railroad probably is more in the center and they, they did expand this highway but essentially the alignment is going to be pretty much the same. The One of the places where there would be a departure from this alignment would be for what was called Nicholson Tunnel. Uh, we're not going through any tunnel on, on this particular roadway. Uh, but this, this, and here comes La Plume, which was in the next stop, if the train stopped, uh, west of, of Clark Summit. But the tunnel, um, there, there, there are tunnel on both lines. There's a Factoryville tunnel, which is on the new line. That's a a brick line tunnel, which is unique on the on the Lackawanna. And, and then there's the the Nicholson tunnel or tunnels, because there are two separate tunnels on on this line. Uh, we won't see those here because they're they're off, off to the side, so to speak. Um, and when they when they built this road, they they were wise enough to bypass those tunnels. But as I said, that the the line is essentially is roughly 50% curves, and you can see we're going 
through another, yet another curve. I can show you photos of those tunnels. Uh, there was uh, a trolley line which actually wanted to use them and that didn't work out, but uh, back in the days when uh, trolleys were still pretty much the rage. I want to say the Northern Electric Trolley or Traction Company. So this is primarily a, I don't know if I would call it rural, but certainly not a heavily populated area and it was not in the days of when they they, they built the the Pennsylvania cutoff and the Lackawanna really didn't have a way to create a, a, a passenger base that would have justified having stops or you know, where trains would stop with inter, uh, intermediate wise on the uh, the Pennsylvania cutoff. There were trains that did stop once again through the 50s, but um, the, the the big name trains like the, once again the Phoebe Snow did not because there just wasn't enough ridership to to justify that. The the cutoff was built with the intent of the trains would be able to do at least 70 miles an hour most of the time. They, they tried to keep, like the New Jersey cutoff, tried to keep the curves 2% or uh, 2 degrees or below, which they were not able to do all the time. Uh, the, they're, they're, they have a, I think a couple of three degree curves. The, the difference between the New Jersey cutoff and the Pennsylvania cutoff, and you see Tunkanic here, that's a different town. The Tunkanic Creek Viaduct is named after the Tunkanic Creek. But when they built the, the Pennsylvania cutoff, uh, they, they stayed on the side of, of, of hills for the most part, whereas the New Jersey cutoff uh, was going basically right angles through hills and therefore you'd have a cut through the hill and then a, a, a fill and then a cut through the next hill and then a fill and, and then so forth. Here you're basically on this cutoff, there's a, a um, it's not quite the same. The experience on what I can remember riding on a train is that if you're on the wrong side of the train, you're, you're looking up at the side of a cut, whereas the other side of the train is looking out and have a nice view of the, the countryside. On the New Jersey cutoff, it's rare that there's uh, where one side has a good view and the other one doesn't. It's either either or. Either both sides have a good view or, or both sides don't if you're in a cut. High school next left.
want to say that the, the line went off to the left here, because this is, seems like too steep of a grade for a railroad, and I'm guessing that this is where the, the road and the old railroad bed um, have separated, and that the tunnel would be somewhere off to our left. This is way too steep for a, a, a railroad, at least a, one would expect for a mainline railroad. And we're just about, we're just entering Nicholson now. But we will rejoin the old right-of-way. on the other side of this hill. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing this is like 3, 4%. This would be um, for a, a mainline railroad, this would be a monstrous grade. Remember in the previous episode, I talked about the rule of thumb for every 0.1% increase in grade, it means a 40% increase in, in horsepower that's required to have the same equivalent effect as would be on a flat and straight piece of track. So you're talking about 1%, you're talking about basically a 400% a increase in effort. So the decreasing the grade has a, an enormous effect on the amount of power, or the number of locomotives, or horsepower, however you want to look at it, that is needed to, to pull particularly freight trains, although it would, you know, to some extent, affect uh, passenger trains as well. Like the grade going up to Clark Summit it was 1.4 percent, so you're talking about what 560 percent increase in power needed. So that's why they had to add additional locomotives to pull pull or push trains up the hill. And the building of this cutoff eliminated a good portion of that. It didn't eliminate the, the grade going up from Scranton. There was nothing that really could be done about that. Uh, there were some crazy ideas about building a viaduct across the uh, Scranton Valley, and uh, that, that didn't go anywhere. Um, it would be almost impossible to find places that were stable because of all the coal mines in and around Scranton. Even if you were to contemplate such a thing, it would there'd be no way you could be guaranteed that you, you wouldn't be building over a mine shaft and have your whole viaduct fall into the, the, the mine. So as a result, that, that idea was just basically that, that went nowhere. Now there actually were several different routes that were, ah, here we go. Surprise. Tonkanic viaduct. And we'll show you a, a view of this as a railroad going past the Tunkhannock Viaduct. Just go literally under it. And you see, obviously, we are in Nicholson, and we have a sign which says Nicholson, and it has a pretty picture of a familiar looking bridge. Tonkanic Creek Viaduct, the Nicholson Viaduct, Nicholson Bridge, whatever you want to call it, one and the same. Just 
say that it is big is an understatement. In fact, trains on top of it look like toy trains because it's so big. So, this, this is Nicholson. What we're going to do is we're going to join our friend Josh Stull. And he's going to join us for the rest of the trip going out to Binghamton. And we will rely on his expertise and knowledge as a historian. And uh, so off we go to meet with him and we will begin our trek westbound or northbound, however you want to look at it, to Binghamton. Hi, we're here at Nicholson, Pennsylvania. This guy's hometown. This is Josh Stull. Did I, did, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. I am. Stull. Stull. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, and, and I'm going to get out of the picture here and let you just handle it from here in terms of talking about this structure behind us and uh, that structure a little bit maybe as well. Okay. Great. Thank you, Chuck. All right, hi, yeah, my name is Josh Stell. So I grew up in Nicholson, Pennsylvania, population 700. I'm obsessed with the DLNW, um, and so I'll just jump right in. The station behind me was built by a predecessor railroad called the Liggett's Gap Railroad in 1849. Uh, it was originally actually built to house the workers who built the line between Scranton and Great Bend, and then eventually, uh, it became the passenger and f um, freight station. So the freight station, based, the freight part of the station is basically a little bit to the right of the big door here. The middle two windows is the station agent room, and then the room on the end is the uh, passenger side. So when the DLNW built their new um, cutoff, the new line, which of course is now where you see the bridge over there, they still use this station as the freight station uh, because they built the new passenger station up on the side of the mountain next to the bridge. That building is no longer around. It burned in the 90s, I believe, and they just tore it down. But then they, the DLNW had a spur line that went to the town next up, five miles north, six miles north of us, called Hot Bottom. So that spur line service Hot Bottom and then Nicholson here. And then um, I always like to say that the station, this station was a passenger and freight station, which it's true, it was, longer than it was just a freight station. Um, in terms of the, the bridge itself, um, I've already told this to Chuck, my bedroom faced the bridge, so every morning I would see the sun coming through the arches, hence the obsession. <laughs> But um, the, station, uh, the bridge itself, three, three years to build, um, it was about a million dollars out of the 12 million that cost to, to build the cutoff. And, um, you know, at one point, you'd, you'd be seeing trains go, what, 10, 20 times a day between passenger and, and freight lines. And now it's just, uh, it's used for freight by Norfolk Southern who bought it from Canadian Pacific about three years ago. Uh, in terms of Nich Nicholson itself, I mean, this, this station was a center of the community. It was the post office at one point. Um, I mean, this is how people went to and from. There's a hotel that was built uh, right here. It's called the Nicholson House. You won't, you won't be able to see it maybe, but um, hotels were built around the station because with all the traffic coming, and definitely when they were building the, the bridge, people needed a place to stay. Um, in terms of what's going on with the station now, uh, the Nicholson Heritage Association, of which I'm a member, received a PennDOT grant in 2014, and so it's going to be used to renovate the station, keep it as close to original as possible, and then have it as a, uh, a museum that people can come and visit 
telling the history of not just Nicholson, the railroading, but tying it into the the DLNW, also the Route 92, which is right over going this way at Tunkhannock. It's a byway. It's called the Viaduct Valleyway Scenic Byway. It goes to uh, the Strucker Viaduct in Lanesboro. Also a pretty cool build, uh, structure. That was a, a cut stone bridge built in 1848. Okay, Josh and I are here again. We've moved a little westbound to what the railroad called Foster. You won't find, I don't know where Foster came from. Do you know where Foster? I, I, I don't. Uh, it, if you, it, the, the town of Hop Bottom is nearby, and in fact, up until 1870, the railroad, when the, we're now, I should point out, on the new line, the cutoff here, this is the, the Foster Station on the, the new line. The town of Hop Bottom, where the old line was, is down below us. And uh, Josh will explain more about the, the history or whatever you want to talk about, uh, about Hop Bottom and also the, uh, the, the fact that there was rail service continued beyond when, that, when this was opened in 1915. Great, thanks Chuck. So right, so this is the new main line, and as Chuck said, somewhere here was the old Foster Station that was actually built when the new line was opened in 1915. Like Nicholson, down at the bottom of the hill, Hot Bottom is basically that way, they had a spurred line that came from um, excuse me, basically in the middle of Hop Bottom and Nicholson, they had a spur line that came down the hill, and actually you can, it's right over the hill here, that went to the old freight station in Hop Bottom, and then also to the freight station slash the former passenger and freight station Nicholson. And so um, the station that was here before on this location was just passenger similar to Nicholson, the station that was up next to the bridge was passenger only. And so, um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly year that they had freight service continue, but it, it's at least in the 70s. And, and for, for Nicholson, the big thing was automobiles. There was an automobile deal, dealership. So they had cars delivered by tra uh, train, by rail, and feed. And even for Hot Bottom, there was a feed feed store here because you know this part of Pennsylvania uh, dairy farming was was very big and the farmers um, needed the feed so thanks here we are at the Martins Creek Viaduct in Kingsley Pennsylvania this is the smaller sister of the two viaducts in or on the Nicholson cutoff. I'm going to hand it off to Josh who's going to talk a little bit about the the viaduct and there's some interesting aspects about this which are really unique and which you don't see in any of the other three viaducts that the the Lackawanna built on its two cutoffs. Thanks Chuck. Yeah one is that uh, Martins Creek Viaduct was finished a year before the cutoff opened 
And when they finished in 1914, they actually had a party up on the, um, on the deck of the viaduct. And then if you look at the top, um, what I appreciate uh, for the Martins Creek Viaduct versus the Tonkana Creek Viaduct is for the columns, it's more, it's modern deco. See how it has the fancy um, raised motif and then it actually comes out where for the Tonkana Creek Viaduct, that's basically all just flat. And so it's a nice little touch to the little sister of the Tonkana Creek Viaduct. Keep going. Oh. Yeah. You still recording? I missed something. I just want to point out, and we have a nice photo from the Steamtown archives, which will show, this is the, the old road, the old line, which goes through the arches, or this particular arch here. We have a really nice shot of a train coming through here. From the opposite side, the shot was taken, just and gives you an idea. This is one of the places we talked about where the, the two lines were close together. Well, in this case, they literally cross, you know, this one crossed under that one up on top. And it is, it's kind of interesting because this, this structure was already up when trains were still running, um, as was the case in, in Nicholson as well. But it gave the people on the trains an interesting perspective of seeing they're riding the old line, but they're seeing what's going to be coming into the future, the future being 1915, as opposed to, you know, today, 2019. Done. Here we are at Alfred, Pennsylvania. The station is still here on the new line. The, the tower, which we'll look at shortly, is behind our videographer. I'll leave it to you. What do you want to say about the station? It's, it's in not good shape. It's been deteriorating, uh, but it is still here, and that's better than or more that we can save for some stations. And so, I'll turn it over to, to Josh. Sure, one tidbit of information is that on the old line, they had a new station built 1911-1912. And then of course, when the line was opened in 1915, they tore that old station down and then you have the new station. So do you want to walk in or do you want to just... Uh, we, we, we can, you can lead the way and we'll sure. follow. So just, uh, just thought I would talk about the station inside, the freight room, because for Alford, the station was both freight and passenger. So right now we're in the freight side of the station, and we won't walk all the way through, because I don't think we would need to, but the next room is the station agent's office. Of course, you can see how bad it is once the roof goes, everything, uh, water damage, does wonders. And then the next room after that was the uh, passenger side of the station with there's two rooms in the back end, which was the, the uh, restrooms. And I don't know if Alyssa, the videographer can see this, but uh, there's actually a stairway that goes down to the basement, which is now all full with water. So uh, we, we won't be going in there. And um, there actually was a second floor as well. You can see there was an attic, but um, it was a pretty nice station when it was built. Now this station, the, the, the station you, you uh, mentioned at the beginning, the, I'll say the original Alfred station that was supposed to be on the cutoff uh, ended up being a mistake because the alignment of the cutoff was changed after it was built. So that's the reason why this is the second station that was built, but not because it was on the old line, but because it was um, 
it, the, the alignment of the cutoff itself had been changed in the meantime, in between the time of the planning for the station and the time they actually built it. Okay, we've moved just slightly east of the station at Alford. This is the old interlocking tower. Uh, I'm gonna let Josh speak to it. It's um, n not in any better shape than the, the station is, but it is here, so that's, that's the good news. Um, Josh, what do you have to say about this? Sure, so uh, like the station, it was built in 1915 and it was the interlocking tower for the Montrose branch, which Montrose is the county seat for Susquehanna County. And um, like other parts of this part of Pennsylvania, dairy farming was a big deal. And um, Chuck reminded me that the Montrose branch was discontinued in 1940, 1941. And, yeah. and, and also the, the station in Alfred was originally named Montrose mm. at one time. At some point, my, I'll call it my hometown station was originally called Montrose as well. I guess there would have been confusion, but there was actually a Montrose which was called Montrose. Mm -hmm. um, the, the station in South Orange, New Jersey turned, it became a uh, mountain station. Some of, it seems like some of these stations, they, they, the Verero changed the name so there wasn't confusion to passengers, uh, but it might have been confusing to people who lived in the area, like Hot Bottom and Foster, Foster that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. People say, I want to go to Hot Bottom. Well, there, there is no Hot Bottom, there's only Foster, right. but that kind of thing. But uh, so, but this station, I think you remember, we, we've both been on Steamtown yeah. uh, excursions, which came here. Yeah. Uh, it, they, unfortunately, Steamtown doesn't do those excursions anymore, yeah. but. And what else can we say? Um, other than that, this is an active line, Norfolk Southern. Uh, we, we're still waiting for a train to come yeah. by. We, we don't know. I mean, we don't know the schedule, but uh, we'll, we'll see. If fingers we catch, crossed. We'll have our fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll see if we catch, capture a train. Yeah. Well, here we are at Halstead, Pennsylvania, uh, being eaten alive by gnats. And in part 21, it was all sorts of different bugs, and uh, now we've, at least I've graduated to gnats, but uh, Josh has joined me. First time. We're first time. <laughs> um, Halstead is, is, somewhere in here is the end of the cutoff, but I'll, I'm, I, Josh wants to talk about the, the, the station here, and then we'll get into a little bit of a mystery we think that we have in our hands and we're trying to solve. Thank you. Yeah, I thought I would just talk about this station. As you can see, it looks a lot like the Alfred station that we just came from. 
And um, the big difference though is this was built in 1903-1904 and it actually looks in fairly good shape but that's because up until it looks like fairly recently it was used as um, um, a senior living home and um, it still has a sign of course Halstead. Uh, I'll turn it over back to Chuck to talk about cut off. Yeah, the mystery that we have is that the Pennsylvania cutoff was built in, in 10 sections. At least if you look at a map, which we'll show you. And, but the 10th section ended at New Milford, which is east of here. However, the cutoff continues and presumably continued a little bit farther west, northbound, or well, north of here, but westbound of here. But there wasn't any contractor associated with that section. Now, what's unique about this section is that it is in, there was a lot of overlap between the old and the new. And we're wondering if perhaps, and we'll be doing more research on this, if we're wondering if perhaps there wasn't as much of construction involved with this other than maybe moving tracks from this spot to another. Because if, if the cutoff was still here, in other words, the cutoff still had a little bit to go, this station here, it wouldn't make any sense that it would be from 1904. Because obviously the, the, the cutoff didn't start construction until 1912. They wouldn't have known. It just doesn't make any sense unless the old and the new were very, very close to one another, in which case, or maybe even um, occupying the identical spot, which in some cases it did. So this is a, not a huge mystery, but it is something that needs further looking into because it is kind of a, a little bit of a, a poser in terms of, well, why is that? It doesn't make a lot of sense. But... Um, the, we'll, we'll figure it out, or maybe we won't, but e either way, we'll, we're going to at least try to figure it out. So, uh, we, we do have one more stop to make, and that is the, the city of Binghamton. And there we'll, we'll talk about a few things, um, not the least of which perhaps is uh, the shirt I've been wearing. And, uh, but there are a few other things to talk about as well at Binghamton, uh, being it was one of the major cities on the Lackawanna. about a mile or so west of New Milford. New Fr Milford is in that direction. Halstead is in this direction. First of all, let me put aside the overarching issue they brought up at Halstead, and that is about section 11. There's no section 11. There's only a section 10. I misread the map, and this particular section, which I'm gonna describe because it is unique, uh, the, the cutoff portion was done by Walter H. Gahagan. Now, what you just saw is not the cutoff. When we get to the building of the, the cutoff, which I'm going to go through a little bit of a chronology first, but when we get to the building of the cutoff, there are actually two separate lines here, an old line and a new line, which is behind us or behind me. But let's start at the beginning, just to orient you. The line you see over here opened on October 15th, 1851. This is the original line. This goes back even, if you want to go back even further, with the Lincoln's Gap Railroad, but 
This was built by the Delaware and Lackawanna. It's not even the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western yet. So that line is there in 1851. As we go through the early 1900s, President Truesdale takes over as the president of the Lackawanna, at that point the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. They, they, they want to improve the, the railroad. They want to make it more efficient. In New Jersey, the New Jersey cutoff is built, and that's finished at the end of 1911. Work here begins in May of 1912, so just a few months after the, the finish of the New Jersey cutoff. Now, the section between New Milford and Halstead, which is about six miles, is unique for a, f a few reasons, but specifically, it's unique because when they build the cutoff here, it actually is in addition to this line here. They don't take away this line, as they do basically almost everywhere else on the, the cutoff east of New Milford. Now, New Milford sits at the summit, so on both ends, this side and the other side, there are grades going down. On this line, it was 0.9%. Uh, they wanted to improve that for a couple of reasons. One was just to improve the grade, but also freight trains coming in out of Halstead Yard. Halstead Yard was located just across from the station that we were just at. So what they do is Mr. Gahagan and company are contracted to build a new line for the ascending grade. In other words, the upgrade from Halstead to New Milford. The downgrade or descending grade from New Milford to Halstead remains the same. It's still the, the same old line. So you will have two tracks here and then two tracks up here. And I'm literally going to point that out. Now, maybe getting ahead of myself, but the thing is that this line up here, the cutoff up on that embankment, which will basically run parallel to the road, which will take you a little bit of a ride in a few minutes. It, it, it's gone. In, in some cases, completely gone, but it's, it, it's abandoned and, and it's no longer used. So essentially what was done is that as you go toward New Milford, the new line, the cutoff, came like this and joined up, or shall we say diverged, from the old line and then as you go towards Halstead eventually what happens is this new line eventually diver diverges in or converges in to this line and so and so what you end up with at least at the, the beginning when the cutoff opened in 1915, November 1915, you had two tracks here, two tracks there. And at the summit, you had four tracks together. But then they, you have the two uh, on each right away diverging, and then you get four going into Halstead. So it stays like that for a bit. Better part of 30 about 30 years or so. But I, 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 before I even get to moving on, I, I do want to add that this section here, the Gahagan section, was plagued with all sorts of issues in terms of, uh, well, a swamp that this basically went through. <laughs> This line they built away from the swamp, well this one they built into the swamp.
They had problems with sinkholes and they had problems with quicksand. Uh, quicksand was a problem at the Tonkanic Viaduct and actually delayed that project for the better part of four months. But here, they didn't have the advantage of building the a viaduct on top of this, they had to build with a dirt fill, which in 1927 leads to a, a, pr a big problem in that there was a, a fatal wreck that occurred, uh, which we will show you where we think it might have happened. But whatever the case, Gahagan finally gets to the bottom of this bottomless swamp and, and is able to fill it in and build embankments where they needed to have embankments to, to basically lessen the grade. They lessen the grade to 0.6. So it's 0.9 here, 0.6, and it's an improvement. So now fast forwarding, after the Second World War, late 1940s, they, they, they take out the, the extra track so that you only have one track here and one track up there. Uh, they didn't need it for the freight traffic that, that was there at the time when they built the, the cutoff with four tracks. And that will remain pretty much the, the story and uh, through the Erie Lackawanna years. I can show you a photo of Erie Lackawanna where they're uh, close to New Milford where there are still two tracks. Conrail takes over and we start to we see a story that plays out not only similar very similar to what happens in New Jersey. Don't forget this is one continuous line between Hoboken and, and Binghamton. The cutoff was part of that. This cutoff, the Pennsylvania cutoff, was part of that. At the end of 1978, the New Jersey cutoff is put out of service and is that's the opening salvo towards abandonment. The same thing happens over here. Now the difference over here is that there there will be an effort to save it, and there will, a, a railroad will come in. Now, um, interestingly enough, it was back in the late 50s with the, the New Jersey cutoff is single tracked. They actually kicked that around. Perry Shoemaker, the president of the Lackawanna at that time, the last president of the Lackawanna, kicked around that here with with this cutoff where you have the the two. Well, it, the whole cutoff would have been two tracks, but here you would have two tracks that are separated by uh, a, a space, a distance. When you get to the uh, right around 1980, the Delaware and Hudson becomes interested in this line. And it so happens that Perry Shoemaker's son, Kent Shoemaker, plays an integral role. He's the president of the Delaware and Hudson, the D&H, and they, they acquired this line for operations. So this is saved at the same time while things are playing out not so well in New Jersey. Now the Delaware Hudson will be here. Um, I think the New York Susquehanna, uh, Susquehanna and Western will be, will take over for a little bit. The Canadian Pacific uh, ultimately, the Norfolk Southern, right around 2005, will, will take over the line. But the story with this cutoff will be a, a series of woes that occur starting in the 1980s, late 1980s, after the line is abandoned. They, they take up the tracks. They decide they don't need the, the this is with the Delaware and Hudson, they decide they don't need that extra track and they only basically will have that track which they will be using, the old line. Well that opens the door and this is coincidentally at the, the same time that Mr. Turco was talking about taking away the fill off the cutoff in New Jersey, they, the DNH sells off this right-of-way. I'm not sure if they actually sell it off but they, they basically give a local sand and gravel company in, out of New Milford the rights to take it up and, and they actually Lots of the, not all of it apparently, but um, in some places the fill is literally taken up and the right of way disappears. We'll, we'll travel along that. It's going to be very difficult in places to really tell where there was a railroad. But the reason why that's done is that the Public Utilities Commission in, in Pennsylvania comes in and condemns several of these underpasses. You know, problems similar to what you see in New Jersey where you have narrow underpasses, you have a, a school that's over here. Um, but this, that occurs after the, the railroad is abandoned. So 
basically, and we'll show you where we think that there's a, a remnants of one of those overpasses, but basically the, the railroad, this railroad, the cutoff ceases to exist as of about 1990-ish or so. So when you think of the, the cutoff, is it now only the Clark Summit of New Milford cutoff? Well, people still refer to it going to Halstead, but technically the cutoff portion of the right of way from New Milford to Halstead doesn't exist anymore. It's not used, and it's in some cases literally gone. So that's pretty much the chronology. That brings you up to date. I mean, uh, the Norfolk Southern takes over about it was about 1950, uh, 1915, I'm thinking, to 2015, off by 100 years. And they had been operating this line ever since. But it's interesting to see that the, there were parallel th things that were occurring both to the New Jersey cutoff and to the Pennsylvania cutoff. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump in the car. I'm going to give you a little bit of a Cook's tour to show you where the cutoff was. It's going to be difficult to really tell. You have to use your imagination. But we'll, we'll see if we can at least give you an idea of where the, the section here, the ascending grade uh, between New Milford and uh, Halstead actually ran. Okay, so we're going to go from this spot and take you for a trip along the, the cutoff, the ascending grade. We're, we're actually going in the direction from New Milford towards Halstead. The, the grade is just off to our left. And then we go through a, a spot here where there's, it's gone, but it would have been very close to the road here on the left-hand side in this open area. it continued, well, uh, we know it's still on the left-hand side of the road since it would have been torn out oh, roughly around 1990-ish or so. These housing units are, are new since then. It would have crossed here. There would have been some sort of underpass. This would have been the one, one of the ones that was condemned and uh, abandoned. sure if this is Salt Lick Creek or not, but it, it has a number of different tributaries, but and you can see ahead of the grade crossing for the original line. At this point, the two rail lines are about 700 feet apart. That's a rough guess. Um, up on the left here is where the the line would be cut off. Just beyond the telephone pole. And here it crossed. You can see off to the left here what appears to be the remnants of the underpass. The river would have been above us here.
crossing from the left side of the road to the right side of the road, which will be from, from here on in. Once again, the, the old line, the original line, is further to our right, uh, 100, no more than 200 yards or so on our right, farther down below. Now here we're going to enter into, like I call it a gully or a, a, a low spot. Our, the cutoff is to our right, it would have been two tracks, but it's, the embankment is gone. I, clearly there's nothing here. even a sign of it per se other than there's a space but um, you, you wouldn't know if you didn't know that 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 the line was here you there'd be no way you would ever know that uh, there was a set of railroad tracks right at this spot Okay, here we are at what may be the site of the October 19th, 1927 wreck of train 28, which was a, a local train which ran from Buffalo to Binghamton through Halstead, which is a couple miles, three miles actually in this direction and then uh, well would have continued had it not wrecked here to, to Milford and its last stop was scheduled to be Scranton. So what happens on the 19th of October is that the train 28 leaves Halstead around 6 p.m. and is traveling eastbound, you can say actually southbound, but eastbound in this direction here towards Scranton, towards New Milford, and it hits a, a washout. There is a stream nearby, not sure if that is the where exactly where it would have occurred but um, we're at the side of a hill so it's possible with lots of rain that it's cascading down the side of the hills and there's a washout the train the the engine goes into the washout that either the tracks are gone or they've done one of these things and both the the engineer and the fireman are killed uh, the account from the New York Times from the next day uh, says that two men were killed when the engine, a milk car and three express cars, express cars meaning like baggage cars basically, of a Lackawanna passenger train bound from Binghamton to Scranton ran into a washout three miles from Holstead, Pennsylvania. And that would be about here and this would be on the ascending grade so this is this this is, would be approximately where that would have occurred the engineer Newton L Esther Brook and his fireman Luke P Monroe both of Elmira were crushed to death none of the passengers were seriously injured it was a passenger train there were passenger cars behind would been an engine uh, coal tenor a milk car and then an express car well, I think it was like three express cars and then there was um, the passenger cars behind it. The passenger cars don't end up going down the embankment. Uh, presumably, what happened was that the, the engine went in that direction. 
because where we're located, just the terrain here. Some of those on the wreck train arrived to Scranton late tonight, meaning, you know, the the the, the day before this was printed in the in the Times. Uh, Joseph Bradley of this city, meaning Scranton, uh, told of his rescue from one of the cars which plunged into the engine. Uh, quote, I was sitting on the safe in the express car. I assume it was actually a, literally a, you know, a, a safe with money in it. We were going about 40 miles an hour and suddenly the emergency brake was applied by the engineer and the train came to a sudden stop and then lurched forward again. I was thrown along with the safe to one of the end of the car and I knew we dropped. Then I lost my bearings from the bump on the head and didn't know much more until I felt some men carrying me up. And Bradley said that the washout was between 20 and 30 feet deep. And they talked about Lewis Carney and um, John Gilhooley. Um, and they said they hung on to the brink of the washout as the train was wrecked. Both were found buried under trunks and traveling bags, but were not hurt. Uh, Lucius Freeman of Binghamton said, a, a, who was a passenger, said that a number of the passengers were thrown from their seats and injured, but none seriously. Uh, the Lackawanna actually had a comment about this, saying that um, uh, it says 6:30 when the, tr the tracks gave way underneath the train, engine and three or four express cars sank about f 15 or 20 feet, and they did not. Uh, the passenger trains did not go into the washout, and no passengers were injured. Well, I, I, that's debatable. Also, uh, there's an account that. The, the lack one said the fog played a, a role, which doesn't really make any sense. Uh, maybe to the extent that maybe the, the engine might be able, the engineer might have been able to see the washout ahead of him, but we don't know. We don't know exactly how the, the washout presented itself. It's possible that the, the tracks may have looked normal, but the, the washout may have taken away the, the dirt underneath and uh, we don't know. I mean, the engineer didn't survive, so we, we don't have that account. And we don't know what happened. And all we know is that the train left the tracks and went down the embankment. So this was the result of, uh, can we say that there's issues with the, this particular ascending grade because of the construction? Um, problem being in a swamp. Um, uh, Salt Lake Creek is down below here, but there are tributaries to it. Is it possible that during a, a heavy storm that that would have undermined the, the railroad? We don't know. Uh, I was unable to get a copy of the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission report of the accident. That would have been helpful, at least to, to the extent to give us more details. So, this is the the wreck from 1927 it takes place only a little over a week after the the Yankees defeat the Pittsburgh Pirates in the 27 World Series in four games. Notable Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, uh, Murderers Row are, are, are part of that team, considered probably the best team that was ever put on any on the field on any any year, individual year by any team in history, in American baseball at least. So we're done in this neck of the woods. Our next stop and final stop is that we're going to, to Binghamton and rejoin Josh Stull. Yeah, I can send you this photo and you can put it in the Okay, in, in sure. The thing. Seriously, yeah, you can, that's fine, yeah. Google. Um, All right. Okay. okay, it's good timing.
Here we are in Binghamton, New York, at the station, the Lackawanna Station, built in 1901. The Norfolk Southern train is westbound on what was the old Erie Railroad. The tracks in the foreground are from the, are the Lackawanna, former Lackawanna Railroad. You can see that how close the two railroads are here. And when the two railroads merged in 1960, actually starting as early as 1958, they did some track consolidations, which had the Lackawanna give up its right of way west of Vestal, which is, uh, I'm going to say, about 10 miles west of here. So this track in the foreground here is a dead end spur and, and the, the line has been cut back since then. So the, the Norfolk Southern freight that's passing is, is on a through line whereas the, the Lackawanna, the former Lackawanna is a, is a dead end. What else did I want to talk about? Um, I'm going to hand it over to Josh first while I think about what it is else I wanted to cover. He wants to talk about this, this big thing that's over here. Thanks, Chuck. So, oh, all right. So this is the Marconi Tower erected in 1913. And it was erected to test uh, telephonic messages on passing Lackawanna railroad trains. And so they have a nice little placard that they erected there. but. Uh, Yep, still standing. And I think if I remember correctly, Chuck, you want to talk about your shirt and the connection with New York. Yeah, and I also remember what I was going to talk about before the shirt. Uh, the, I wanted to talk about the, the, the cutoff that never got built. And that was the Nichols cutoff. Not Nichols' son, but Nichols' cutoff. And the reason why it was called Nichols, because there's a town in, or I guess it would be a city or a town in uh, New York that's west of here. And that cutoff would have gone from Clark's Summit to Nichols and would have cut off 20 miles, 21 miles I think it was. Uh, there were a number of issues, not the least of which how much it would have cost, but it would have bypassed here at Binghamton. And, this is such a, a large city, relatively speaking. A little bit of a factoid, Binghamton is the largest city in the state of New York that does not have passenger rail service. So, which kind of begs the question, why doesn't it? And there, there have been proposals to do rail service here, even Amtrak. My personal feeling is they're still waiting for the cutoff in New Jersey to be open so that you can go via Scranton rather than, I mean, today you could run a train between here and Port Jervis in, in New Jersey via the old Erie way back on, in the back there. Uh, but there really has been no real serious consideration given to that. So um, it's, it's, it, it may be that they'll have to wait for the, for the cutoff, the New Jersey cutoff, to be reactivated. Yeah, I was going to talk about my shirt. Uh, first of all, we're, this is our first recording of any type in the state of New Jersey. So I have a New Jersey, well, it's in New York. Did I say New Jersey? Yeah. I'm still thinking New Jersey. Uh, in, in the state of New York. And so I have a New York Yankees shirt on. You could say, well, well, why didn't he pick a New York Mets or some other team? Well, I'm a long-term Yankee fan. I, I, I saw Mickey Mantle play Roger Maris, Whitey Ford, uh, as a kid, though. Uh, but, of course, I would hope I would have been a kid at that time. But there's also a connection between the Yankees and, and the Lackawanna. Um, they, they used to run trains from here. They used to run trains from Cornell for Yankee specials. Scranton, uh, big big town for the Yankees. Of course, they, they, their AAA farm team, the Rail Riders, is located in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre.
AAA is basically the next step down from the major leagues. So there's a historic connection between the, the Lackawanna and, and, the, and the Yankees. So um, that, that's, I had to mention that. I imagine people are looking at me and realizing, no, okay, when's he going to talk about the Yankees? Actually, the, 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 what actually happened was I ran out of shirts. I tried to be vary my wardrobe, and it eventually gets to the point, well, what am I going to wear? So I figure, what the heck? We're going to New York. Let me put a New York Yankees shirt on. Was there anything else I wanted to talk about? Nope, I think no, we've covered it. Oh, I know what we, we were talking about. There's one more thing uh, which we failed to mention. This is going back to near the beginning of the, the video at Clark Summit. Both of the, the cutoffs were originally built with no grade crossings. That's one thing they had in common. Forgot to mention that, so I just had to mention that. Um, so, this is the end of part 25. I want to thank you, Josh. You've been uh, a, a really good sport about doing this. We've, we've finally got together and got to, to do our jaunt. We've uh, covered quite a bit, really. Certainly geographically we've covered a lot, but a lot of um, information as well. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. So this is the end of part 25 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Hope you look forward to part 26 on the Lackawanna Cutoff. Well, that was like an exclamation point. Yeah.